welcome back. Hope y'all had an enjoyable day. Our song for tonight is going to be number 204, Rock of Ages. We're going to do all four. Rock of Ages, clad for me, let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy river side which flow be the sin, the double cure, cleanse me from its potent power, not of labors of my hands can fulfill thy lost demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages clad for me, let me hide myself in thee. Brother Champion. Good morning, or no, that was, that was late earlier, wasn't it? Oh, well, I have a confession to make. I was going to make it this morning when it was fresher on my mind, but uh, I have committed a horrible, horrible sin this morning that I need to confess Got up this morning, went to make my coffee, and my wife, she's to blame for this, had bought a big bag of chocolate donuts. And I haven't had those in years. And I thought, that won't hurt me just a little bit. I ate two of them with coffee. You take a bite, then sip coffee. And everyone was a sin. It was so good. I, did you buy those for the grandkids that were over there? Okay. Then I'll forgive you. I thought you were trying to kill me. That's right. Those chocolate donuts are amazing, aren't they? At least. Right. That's, that's why I thought. That's why I thought, okay, Lord, I'm going to have. You know, I, I usually can eat just about whatever I want to. Just don't have as much. You know, so uh, anyway, we're going to we're going to look at this. I can't think of a better way to to wrap up this. um, These sermons on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit than to talk about seven reasons that support um, eternal security. You know, we as Baptists believe in eternal security. You may not personally, but hopefully you will when we get through, okay? But uh, if you look at John 14, 16, Jesus made, it, made known to us one of the greatest truths in the Bible. And that's this, that when the Holy Spirit moves into a human heart, He moves in to stay. You know, we're not, we're not hotels where the... Spirit of God checks in and out of. We are the house. We're His temple. 
and he stays. Listen to 14, 16, John 14, 16. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, so that he may be with you for how long? Forever. I, I mean, I mean, to me, that's, that says it all. But there's a lot of scripture that I want to talk about. Um, let me make something perfectly clear that uh, there is a clear distinction between those who profess to know Christ and those who possess Christ. Think about our church roles. They're full of names. But those people are kind of like... Uh, like Alka-Seltzer. You know, you drop Alka-Seltzer in a glass of water and it fizzles real fast and then it fizzles out. But uh, there's a big difference. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, 22 through 23. Jesus said, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, this is the sad part, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. And then uh, John said in the, in the first epistle, uh, 1 John 2.19, of course we know that that book was written so people would know they're saved. You know, at the end of, at the end of John, he wrote, he said, I'm writing these things to you who believe so that you will know that you're saved. That whole book is about how to know we're saved. I've preached through that book, and every, every title in the sermon series starts off with, to know you're saved, you must, or you need to know, whatever. But anyway, listen to this. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. Now, that, that's pretty clear. If they were really saved, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be evident that they are not of us. So I think that's pretty clear. People who leave the church, it's just evident that they were never saved. They never knew Jesus. So, the, I've got, like I said, I've got seven of these I want to... I wanna, uh, get through as quickly as possible. And the first one is, uh, the first r reason that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're saved and that we have eternal security is the, the perseverance of the Spirit. Not us, but the perseverance of the Spirit. Look at Philippians 1.6. Listen to what Paul says. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ. Who, who's the one who began the good work in us that will complete it? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who's come into our lives, he is going to complete it, which means we are going to be made more and more and more in the image of Christ. Let me give you a little illustration here. There's a little boy who went to his daddy and he said, Hey, daddy, my, my friend uh, Billy said his daddy has a list of all the men that he could whip. And your name is at the top of the list. And his dad said, really? Okay. So the next time he saw uh, Billy's daddy, he went up to him and said, hey, my son told me that you have a list of all the names of the men you can whip, and my name's at the top of the list. And the man said, yep, that's right. He said, well, I don't believe you can whip me. What are you going to do about it? And he said, I think I'll just erase your name from the list. Well, you know, God's not like that. God's not like that, is He? God is able 
to complete what he starts. You know, he'll, he, he's never going to erase our name. You know, that's just, that's just not the characteristic of an omnipotent God to start something that he cannot finish. When we get saved, our names are written in heaven. And I, be, I believe that with all my heart. And God will never remove our names from his list. Especially not because he is, or that he is not able to complete it. He's just not going to do that. He is, he is an all-powerful God, and he will complete what he starts. And I'm absolutely... Uh, uh, Sure of that. Now you think about what the, what the Holy Spirit does in salvation. First of all, He convicts us of our sin, right? The Holy Spirit convicts us. He's also the one who converts us. He's the one that does the work in our heart so that we can be converted. But He's also the completer. The completer. Let's look at John 3.8. John 3, 8. Let me see. It says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. People who are born of the Spirit... look differently. They act differently because the Holy Spirit is in our lives. You, know, you, you see what damage or where, the, where the, the wind is blowing in the same way you can tell a person who is a believer because we look and we act like Christ. We leave Jesus in our wake, so to speak, or, or at least we're supposed to. So, so it's the perseverance of the Spirit. He is going to complete what He starts. Now if you look at, at Hebrews 10, 14, we're going to look at the, the second reason that, that we can know that our, our eternity is secure. And it's the perfection of the sacrifice that Jesus did for us. Listen very carefully. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He offered the perfect sacrifice, didn't he? The perfect sacrifice. What happened before? If we read the book of Hebrews, it tells us. But listen to Hebrews 10, 14. For by one... I love this verse. For by one offering, he has perfected, love that, for all time those who are sanctified. Guys, that is an amazing verse. If you, can believe, if you can't believe in eternal security from that verse alone, listen, by one offering, one offering, when Jesus hung on the cross, He perfected, perfected, what does that mean, to perfect for all time those who are sanctified. What does it mean to, for us to be perfected? What? Complete. Complete? Now, I know y'all can't remember this far back, but the very first message I preached, I asked a question. You remember what that question was? Do you have to be perfect to be saved? And y'all said, no. And then I said, do you have to be perfect to get into heaven? And that answer is absolutely yes. Not perfect in the way you've lived your life, but He perfects us. That means He makes us righteous. And by one offering, Jesus perfected for all time, all time, those who are being sanctified. We are made perfect. That's the only way we can stand before God is to be perfect. That's the only way. But it's not our perfection. It's the perfection of Jesus that He, 
He transfers to us. He, he, he deposits it into our account, so to speak. And that's what we call being justified. That's what justification is. Okay? But to understand this first, look at verses 1 through 4. Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. For the law, since it has only, it's only a shadow of the good things to come and not the form of those things itself, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually every year. Year after year after year, they had to make the same sacrifices. He said they can't make those, they can't make those who approach here it is again. Perfect. The Old Testament sacrifices never perfected us. But the, what Jesus did perfected us, made us righteous. He said, otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices... There is a reminder of sins every year. For it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Man, that's, a, that, 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 that's an amazing verse, you know? So we don't just get a fresh start, guys, year after year. We get eternal perfection with the sacrifice that Jesus did for us. We're not just coming every year to get forgiveness of sins, He has perfected us. It is completed. It is finished. What He did for us is the finished work. Now there's a third third one, and, and this one is a little harder to understand, but it's our position in Christ. What happens to us when we get saved? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, one of our favorite verses, says this, Therefore... If anyone is what? In Christ. If anyone is in Christ, see that's our position. When we get saved, we are in Christ. He says, this person is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. See, we know that Jesus comes to live within us at salvation. We know that. We know that the Holy Spirit is given to us at salvation. But we, we also need to understand that we, we come to be a part of His mystical body. If we are in Christ, we are a part of the body of Christ. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can't, I can't even imagine thinking... Thinking this, if we are in Christ, if we're a part of the body of Christ and we can lose our salvation, what does that say about Christ? You know, he can't. Jesus is not going to be lost, but we're a part of his body. And we cannot lose salvation because we're a part of the eternal uh, body of Christ. Uh, if we can be lost after we get saved, I mean, that, that just doesn't say a whole lot about Christ to me. Now, remember this. Christ is the invisible part of the visible Christian. That's Jesus. He is the invisible part of the visible Christian. And we are the visible part, the visible part of the invisible Christ. And that's not going to change. We are part of His body. Now, this, is, this next reason is one of my favorite ones. Turn to Romans 8, 28 through 30, one that we know so well. And that's the, the reason is that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son. I mean, what a verse. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose, for those whom He foreknew, and that also can mean foreloved, by the way, 
For those who He foreknew or foreloved, listen, He also predestined to be to become conformed to the image of His Son. See, some people think that that means that God uh, predestines everything that happens to us. You know, it's kind of like the, the woman who, who fell down the stairs and got up and went, Phew, I'm glad that's over with, as if that was that God predestined that for her. But that's not what predestination means. Listen, he says he predestined or determined beforehand. And that's what predestined means, is to determine something ahead of time. So what did God predestine for us? To be conformed to the image of His Son. That's what God predetermined. He doesn't say He predestined who would be saved, who would be lost. He says He predestined us to become conformed to the image of Jesus. That's what God's plan for us. Now, if that is God's plan for us, how can we lose it? Listen, God predestined it. Every person who gets saved, God has predestined that they, be, they will become conformed to the image of a son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren and sisters and these whom he predestined he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified. Now, here's the best one. Or, and these who he justified, listen, he also glorified already. He's already done this. Do you all realize that each and every one of you are already glorified? See, that's past tense. What God predestines, he carries it out. He always does. And we have been predestined by God to be conformed to the image of Christ. And not even hell can stop that. Not even you can stop that if you're genuinely saved. Matter of fact, verse 30 says that we've already been glorified. That is the past tense in the Greek. Think about that. It's past tense. What God has decreed in heaven before the foundation of the world cannot be undone here on earth. In God's eyes, we have already become glorified in God's mind. If we're saved, He's going to conform us to the image of His Son, and He's already glorified us. And now, look at John 5, 24. See, eternal life, He's talking about eternal life here. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into Zoe, eternal life. We've already, be, we've already passed out of death. We're already... Um, we already have eternal life. This is what he's talking about here. Eternal life is life that will never end. Eternal life is a life that will never end. How long is eternity? Well, this verse tells me that I already, I already have eternal life. See, people think the eternal life starts when you enter heaven. But y'all know that's not true, is it? Eternal life starts the moment you put your faith in Christ. Right then. He says you have eternal life. If you are a believer, you have it. You, and if you have it, you cannot lose it. You just can't. You know, if I could be saved and, and, then, and then lose my salvation after 10 years, then all I had was 10-year life. Right? That's it. So whatever you have, if you can lose it, it's not eternal. How can you lose something that's eternal? Think about that. Wow. How, how, can, how can people believe that you can lose your salvation when the Bible is absolutely 
clear. When we get saved, we path, pass out of eternal death into eternal life. It's something that has already taken place. Can you think of anybody in the whole Bible that had salvation and then lost it? Not Judas. Judas didn't even have it. Remember, Peter messed up, but he was a genuine believer. There's a, a last one I want to talk about. Well, two. And the, the next one is found in Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he, Jesus, is also able to save forever those who come to God through him. Listen to this. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. See, what was, the, what was the finished work of Jesus on the cross? Remember when Jesus said, the last thing he said on the cross was, it is finished, right? But did he say, I'm finished? I'm finished working? No, he finished, he finished the work of salvation. But there's something that he's not finished. And that is he ever lives to make intercession for us. That, all, that ought to tell us right there and then. Matter of fact, he prayed, that, he prayed that Peter, or he prayed for his disciples that God would protect them from the evil one. Remember? He's praying for us. Therefore, he is also able to save forever those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Listen, he's able to save forever those who come to God because he's always making intercession for us. That is the unfinished work of Christ. He's doing it now on our behalf. And the last one is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 5. Let's look at this. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable. It's undefiled and it will not fade away and it's reserved in heaven for you, but listen to this, who are kept or who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What is he saying? We don't keep ourselves saved. If that was the case, I, I would have done lost it a long time ago. We are kept and protected by the power of God. He is able to complete our salvation. That's amazing to me. Now, let me caution us against a false idea. And I bet you you know what it is. If, you, if, if you're not sure about this, what would the argument be against eternal salvation? Eternal security. What would some people say? Well, if I believed in eternal security, man, I'd sin like crazy. Right? If you really believed that, if you really believed that, if I really believed it, I wouldn't care what I did. I'd be lost. But if that's what I believed... You know, matter of fact, I might, I'm probably going to have another chocolate donut in the morning. If they're still there, are you going to save them for me? Okay. Okay, so if a person really, if a person that said once saved, always saved, and they thought that they could just sin without impunity, there's two really fatal flaws in the argument here. 
And that's when a person really believes, when the person really believes this, all it shows is that they're, they've never been saved. Anybody who believes that they can walk down an aisle, take a, take, fill out a card and get baptized and then live any way they want to, it's obvious that they are two of those bad soils in the parable of the, of the four soils. They had it. They never had it, but they, they were Alka-Seltzer Christians. They just fizzled out. They never had it. Okay? There's, if there's no evidence in their life confirming a person's salvation, then there's no evidence. There has to be evidence. And there's another flaw, and that's this. A genuine believer cannot continue to commit the same sins over and over and over again and not expect God's discipline. If you can sin and God never disciplines you, that ought to tell you something right there. Jesus, God, Hebrews 12, 6 and 7 says, For whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, and He punishes every son who He accepts. Every son. It's for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Let me close with this. There is a sense. There is a sense that I sin all I want to. Think about this. I sin all I want to. Am I, am I contradicting what I, the whole message? Now think about it. That's right. I sin all that I want to. As a matter of fact, I sin more than I want to. I really do. Because I don't want to. When we get saved, we're new creations. Our desires change. See, once I got saved, God implanted a whole new desire in my heart. And even though I still sin, I just don't want to. But I still do. So if you still want to sin, you need to be born again. Right? All right. Well, guys, thank you all for the last three weeks allowing us to come and, uh, and participate with y'all in worship and enjoy worship with y'all. Do y'all have any questions about this? Or maybe share a testimony about this idea about eternal security? I could not get through life not having eternal security. Now, you know, I have assurance, blessed assurance, and it's wonderful, but knowing that I can never lose what God has given me, that is unbelievable. What a blessing we have. All right. Well, let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word and thank you lord for the assurance that you give us that once we're saved we are always saved that we have eternal security i thank you lord that that i'm a part of a denomination that really believes that that knows we cannot lose our salvation and how ridiculous it is to even think that once you have begun the work in us, that you're going to complete it. You're going to take us all the way to glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word and how it assures us that once we're saved, we are always saved and that you are going to continue our life, our entire life, to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. In His name we pray. Amen.
Okay, I gave you back a few minutes from the last three times I preached on Sunday morning. 